I'm Carl Azus. There's a lot that's unknown about North Korea, at least outside of its secretive communist government. But today's edition of CNN 10 is going to explain what is known as North Korea's relationship with South Korea continues to get worse. We told you yesterday how the North blew up a diplomatic office that it and South Korea used to hold meetings. No one was hurt. North Korea says it destroyed the building because people in South Korea were sending leaflets across the border that spoke out against the North Korean dictatorship. But there's more to the story. South Korea and the United States are allies, and the leaders of all three countries started holding direct meetings two years ago to talk about the decades-old rivalry on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea and the U.S. wanted North Korea to end its controversial nuclear program. North Korea wanted the U.S. to end its sanctions, its penalties on North Korea's economy that were put in place because of that nuclear program. But the talks got hung up over disagreement about who takes action first. And analysts say that North Korea might have blown up the diplomatic office to get attention on the issue. It's done things like this in the past. Isolated, sanctioned, and at war, North Korea is one of the world's few truly pariah states. Living largely cut off from the internet and global trade has come at a punishing cost for its people. But two things have made the secretive state's economic survival possible. Its efforts to be self-sustainable and the support of key allies. North Korea's tumultuous relationship with most of its neighbors and the U.S. has seen it bear the brunt of a long list of international sanctions. Some measures have aimed to cripple parts of the economy supporting the regime's nuclear missile program, wiping hundreds of millions of dollars from the country's annual income. Others have targeted regime officials for human rights violations. But North Korea has long worked to produce enough food and goods domestically to supply the country. Looking at the relatively middle-class lives on display in the showpiece capital Pyongyang, you might think that's been a success. But the capital is only home to around 3 million of the most privileged, most loyal citizens. For the other 20 million plus North Koreans living outside this city, poverty is the most common way of life, especially in the countryside. North Koreans often go without the basics, like clean water, medicine, and nutritious food. The country's economy is largely agrarian, and crop failures have led to mass food shortages and the need for UN emergency food aid. Internationally, North Korea's recent overtures for peace attracted attention, but it has been the communist regime's more hidden relationships that have reaped benefits for the North Korean elite. China has been North Korea's main trading partner. Coal, seafood, and agricultural products have all flowed from North Korea, while China has pumped Pyongyang with enough oil to fuel its industries. According to the U.S., Beijing's consistently poor enforcement of international sanctions has also provided an economic loophole for Pyongyang. Meanwhile, a black market in Korean goods blossomed thanks to the secretive nation's porous border with China, with profits believed to go to the North Korean regime. In 2017, following a string of North Korean nuclear tests, Beijing finally cut off Pyongyang's access to its financial system. Nevertheless, China remains a key intermediary between the Hermit Kingdom and the outside world. Russia also maintains relatively close ties with North Korea. It's rooted in their Cold War alliance. Both Russia and China have helped shield North Korea at the UN Security Council, repeatedly rebuffing US attempts to impose harsher sanctions. Both nations have also been home to North Korean companies and labor, with some workers in Russia working in conditions that the US State Department has described as slave-like labor. In 2019, the U.S. believed North Korea had some 100,000 citizens working abroad, mostly in Russia and China, sending huge amounts of money back home, much of it right into the coffers of the ruling Kim family. And until they were banned by new U.N. sanctions in 2017, foreign labor contracts were a vital source of foreign currency for the North Korean regime. The Kim family has managed to keep a tight grip on power for three generations, putting the survival of the regime above all else, including the North Korean people. Ten second trivia. Which of these aerospace companies was founded first? SpaceX, Scaled Composites, Virgin Galactic, or Blue Origin? Dating back to 1982, Scaled Composites was the first one of these companies on the aerospace scene. But it was SpaceX that built the vehicle that launched two NASA astronauts to the International Space Station last month. 
It was the first time that Americans reached orbit from U.S. soil since the space shuttle program was retired in 2011. SpaceX is a private company that has received billions of dollars from NASA. Its recent launch was a historic success. It's been a couple weeks now since the amazing historic launch. What surprised you the most about the journey? I think just in general, the, the biggest surprise probably for both of us was just how different the rocket felt than what we had experienced with shuttle. I mean, we expected some of that to be different just because it was a liquid fueled rocket and the shuttle had solid rocket boosters. So that was going to be different, but it certainly was a great ride. It was just different, uh, very exciting. Uh, all in all, I would say that was the, the first big highlight. And then the second one was, was getting to space station and uh, seeing three smiling faces when we came through the hatch. It was uh, just great to see those guys. And I, I think they were happy to see us to get a, you know, get a little change of scenery on board station and a little bit more help. Now, Bob, we know you've been busy training for an upcoming spacewalk. Can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing during that walk? And at this point, you know, you're a veteran spacewalker. So what is your favorite part about a spacewalk? We'll be changing out all of the batteries on one of the channels on the space station. Um, from my perspective, having done a few spacewalks and uh, being a veteran, I, I really look forward to the, the views of the Earth when we get a free moment. And, and this time there'll be a Dragon vehicle pointed on the forward end of the space station instead of the space shuttle. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that something new, that new view that I can capture and share with the world. Some might say that the most dangerous part of the mission still lies ahead, the journey home. And this time, you guys won't be landing on a runway when you land back on Earth. You'll be splashing down in the ocean. What are you anticipating the ride back home to be like? And are you guys at all nervous? No, I don't think we're nervous. We watched the Demo-1 flight, the test flight, the uncrewed test flight, and uh, the vehicle performed very well. We've seen the in-flight abort test, and the vehicle performed well again. We have full confidence that the vehicle will perform just like it's supposed to. That being said, it's a, it's a completely different entry profile than what we are used to or have been used to in the space shuttle. We'll land in the water, as you said. We'll land under parachutes. Uh, much more dynamic entry. There'll be much higher G's and, uh, you know, that's just part of the unknown is to, you know, we, we have prepared for it, but uh, we can only prepare so much and, and we'll see how the vehicle does and we'll see how we do when we get back. Now, NASA's ISS program manager, Kirk Shireman, is stepping down and this comes after NASA's head of human space flight resigned in May. How do all of these changes in leadership affect you guys and the other astronauts that are currently living on the International Space Station? I think if you look at who has uh, replaced some of those positions, you'll, you'll, you'll see uh, people from within moving up and stepping into those roles and just doing an excellent job. And so uh, that's one of the, the strengths of an organization like NASA is that uh, we don't rely on a, a single individual to drive the entire uh, assessment and evaluation and, and management effort. We use a team of individuals to do that and, and the team is uh, strong enough to be able to recognize their role in assisting that new leader and in, in coming into their own as they take over the organization. For 10 out of 10 today, it's like a high-tech pet adoption. This is Spot. It's the famous robot quadruped or four-legged dog-like machine from Boston Dynamics. And now American companies can buy their very own Spot for the price of $74,500. Spot can help businesses open doors, walk over rocks and stairs, entertain employees with the robot running man. It has found uses in factories, research labs, and construction sites. But the question is, will someone spot $75,000 just to see Spot run? You could always retrieve a real dog, something more Labradorable, even if it's more likely to leave poodles than a robot. I'm Coral Azus for CNN.